Um, good morning. We're going to um, continue our series through Luke's book, The Acts of the Apostles. This is the second of a two-volume work, actually, the first being the Gospel of Luke. Some have suggested that because of the influence of the Holy Spirit, that this book is better entitled The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus instructed his apostles and those who were gathered with them to wait in Jerusalem for what he called the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Their wait ended 50 days after Passover, after the feast of Pentecost. Pentecost was the second of three great harvest festivals of Judaism. It came between Passover and Tabernacles. And three times Jews made the sojourn to Jerusalem. And the Feast of Pentecost was the most popular one. It was more popular even than Passover because the weather conditions were better at that time, making it easier to travel. In the Old Testament, the Feast of Pentecost is called the Feast of Weeks, the Festival of Weeks, because it comes a week of weeks, 50 days, after Passover. It's also called the Festival of the First Fruits because it coincided with the first of two annual wheat harvests. So the first harvest of a field in a year would be the first fruits. And that's why this festival was sometimes called the Festival of First Fruits because it coincided with the first wheat harvest. Um, what we read in Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The most likely place for the gathering of this 120 where Jesus told them to wait would be in some upper room, perhaps close to the temple, because they come out of wherever they were and a large, large crowd gathered and the temple would have afforded space for such a gathering to exist. We learn a couple of things. The coming of the spirit was unmistakable. It wasn't subtle, but it was auditory, clear. They could see and hear things that led them to believe that something unique was happening. The coming of the spirit was audible. It came like the sound of a the F, like the blowing of a violent wind, which is appropriate because in, I believe, both Greek and Hebrew languages, the word for spirit and the word for wind are the same. And so for the spirit to be characterized by the sound of a wind would make sense linguistically. Um, it must have sounded like a blast of wind like the roar of a tornado, it came from heaven, and it was loud and unmistakable. Not only was the coming of the Spirit audible, something you could hear, it was visible. It was something that could be seen. What they saw, and it says in the text, they saw what, a, what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. In the Old Testament, one of the expressions that is linked with the presence of God is fire. 
it seems that one great flame representing the spirit separated into many different tongues of flame and rested on each individual. There was a big flame and it separated out. And these individual expressions of this one flame separated and rested on the individuals who were waiting and resulted in the men and women who were there breaking forth in inspired speech. And we'll learn about that. Well, listen, listen to what it says in verse 5 of Acts 2. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. There were Jews who had been living outside of Israel, were raised outside of Israel. They had returned to Jerusalem, to the city of the temple, to dwell there. They were described as devout men. These Jews heard these spirit spokespersons speak in their own dialect, the language and the dialect they grew up speaking. They heard this inspired speech, and what they heard was somebody speaking to them in their own language. Tongues in the Bible can refer to kind of a an inspired prayer language. But that's not the sense here. It seems to have been intelligible languages. The word for dialect is the word for a spoken language. So they heard God, words describing what God had done in the language they grew up with. They were utterly amazed, not just at what the Christians said, but that such simple Galileans would know their languages. They realized that this should have been impossible for these Galileans. <laughs> but whatever, they were amazed, astonished. And when Peter got up to speak, they were all ears. They really wanted to understand what is the significance of what we are hearing. We're going to look at that speech next week. What we do this week, we'll think a little bit about observations concerning spirit influence. There is a lot of confusion uh, around spirit influence. And let's see if we can clear away some of the confusion. We'll make two points. The first is that it would seem spirit influence is embodied, not unembodied. Um, we tend today, many tend to view spirit influence as unembodied influence, that God streams spirit influence directly from himself into the minds of people. Now, that might occur, but it would seem from what we see here that that would be the exception, not the rule. It would seem here that spirit influence is embodied, that God directs spirit influence through individuals who interpersonally relate to other individuals, and this spirit influence is transmitted interpersonally. It's unembodied. I mean, it's embodied, excuse me. Um, God could have sent 
the tongues of flame on the crowd if he had wanted to. If that's the way he wanted to do things, he could have done it that way. He can do it however he wants, but that's not the way it happened. He caused these tongues of flame, this ability to speak God's words in different languages, he sent this to rest on these Galilean Jewish believers, and they became the spirit spokespersons. God creates and develops spirit spokespersons. Um, Spirit influence in the Bible was promised, and it was identified that it would be channeled via the sons of Abraham, the the children of Israel, the Jews. Uh, It was prophesied in the Old Testament. Let me just read you what it says. I'm going to read a couple verses from Isaiah just to give us the sense and let you hear. These are the prophecies that were made 700 years before Christ ever came relative to how spirit influence would happen. I want you to listen and see if you can pick out clues as to how spirit influence occurs. Here's what it says in Isaiah 59, 20 to 21. Here's what it says. The Redeemer will come to Zion, which is in Israel, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. That's what it says. My spirit who is on you, and that would be on the Redeemer, my spirit who is on you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth, or from the mouth of your children, or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever. We learn a couple of things about spirit influence. Spirit influence is associated with God putting his words in the mouth of the person who is being inhabited by the Spirit. So the Spirit provides the ability for the one the Spirit rests upon to speak the words of God. This is what the Redeemer would do. That's Jesus. And what it indicates, not just Jesus, but the offspring of Jesus, the descendants of Jesus, and what that would be is it, Isaiah is predicting that spirit influence, the ability to understand and proclaim words from God, would be channeled via Jesus and his descendants, the Jews. Isaiah he even goes further than that to tell us not only that they would be Jews, but where they would be from in Israel. Here's what it says um, in earlier in Isaiah. It says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea. Along the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And what he describes is those to and through whom spirit words would be given will be those Jews from the northern part of Israel, from Galilee. We talked about this before. The southern Jews were Judeans. They were purebred Jews. They were seen as the spiritual elite. North of them were the Samaritans. They were considered um, the most hated of the three different kinds. Galilee in the north, they were Galileans. They were the ones who were loyal Jews, but they weren't spiritually as interested as the Jews of the south. Their history was checkered. They were, I think we could say, more humble Jews. They didn't see themselves as the elite. And if God would ever choose to proclaim spirit words, the Jews would have imagined he would do it with the south of Judeans, but he didn't do that. God chose Galileans of the north because God gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so that individual or those people to and through whom spirit influence is channeled 
there are going to be people who are going to be humbled, not the people you'd imagine. That seems to be what it suggests spiritually. So spirit influence is embodied, not unembodied. And those individuals in the first analysis who will channel spirit influence, they would be Jews, particularly Galileans. And what would happen, these Jews then, those reached by these Galilean Christians, all these Jews who had come to settle in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven, they would take this information, the understanding of, that Peter will explain when we look at it next week, and they will bring this back to the place that they moved from to move back to Israel. They say, we got to go back. They would go back to their hometowns all over the vicinity. And these individuals would proclaim the words that they had heard. Um, they would go back to their hometowns to be witnesses of what they heard from these Galilean spirit spokespersons, and their influence would spread from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts, the ends of the earth. As we think about it then, and this seems to be more the rule than the exception, spirit influence is bittersweet then there is an undeniable sweetness with what they were able to do those influenced by the spirit they heard good news they heard the 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 offer of eternal life again we'll start to look at that next week and there is a sweetness to that the bitter part is they were given this gift of new covenant inclusion, not to give to their countrymen, but to give to Gentiles, those with whom they did not closely identify. And as they go and take this gift to Gentiles, they will be hated. They will be hated by their countrymen. They will be accepted by some Gentiles, but never fully embraced. And so they will spend their lives somewhat disconnected horizontally. Those whom God chooses to send his message will oftentimes experience horizontal disconnection in so doing. And that's what we find here. That's why it's bittersweet. I think they would have loved to have been able to bring this message to their countrymen to those with whom they were closely identified. But that's not how God does things. When he gives a gift to somebody, he channels that gift to that person and through that person to others. Sometimes, oftentimes, to those with whom that person is not closely connected, sometimes Influence travels from father and mother to children, and that can happen, but oftentimes it does not. Um, there's another thing. It says spirit influence is embodied, not unembodied. One more, I think, observation we can make is that spirit influence is corporate, not private. It's corporate, not private. Spirit influence was passed from one person to another via relationships. It didn't have to be this way. God could personally connect with everyone, but that's not the way it worked. Spirit influence occurred as a group of people was together and they were waiting. They experienced spirit influence as they were together. Then another group of people came and they heard these individuals, and they experienced it together. And then these individuals went back to their hometown. And via the relationship, they met together with people. And spirit influence then was channeled from God to these individuals, from these Galileans to these Jews from all over the place, and through these Jews to the Gentiles who lived around the planet. Um, that's what I think. Paul is getting at when he says this in Ephesians 5, 
Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. In Isaiah, somebody who claimed to speak for God, but misrepresented him, the metaphor for how they were functioning, they were drunk. Somebody who is tasked to speak and doesn't speak accurately, the image in Isaiah is a drunk. That somebody who would, if they weren't inebriated, would have clear things to say, but their speech is slurred. And so what Paul is getting at here is don't be drunk in wine. It's not really about don't be an alcoholic. What he's describing is that place where spirit words are spoken clearly. That's where he's ushering them to. Don't go to a place where the message is unclear where somebody claiming to represent God doesn't do so. Go to a place where somebody speaks clearly about what the message is. And that's where he goes on to say, instead be filled with the Spirit, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The point seems to be spirit influence was experienced with others. And what Paul is saying, as you gather to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, where does that happen? It happens when they gather together for worship. That's what Paul is saying. Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Do the things that you're doing now. We can't do it. We have to do it virtually for the time being. Hopefully soon that that will change. But even virtually, we can do it. And there will come a time that we will come back together and we will do what it is Paul says to do. If you want to experience spirit influence, there are personal things. Spend time in God's word by yourself. That's important. Pray all those things. But those things are not substitutes for meeting together because spirit influence is embodied, not unembodied. And it seems that it's experienced corporately, not just privately. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the history of how things began. And you identified those to and through whom you would channel the good news of eternal life. We then even in our day, 2,000 years later, can hear these spirit words, understand that you channeled them through Galileans specifically so that we could know these words two millennia later. And as we hear them, and as we talk about them and listen to them and, and sing about them, we are being influenced by the spirit that you placed in them that has been channeled by them through the words. And thanks for your plan of salvation. The spirit influence flows to and through us to others. Thanks for that. Would you continue to help us to understand these spirit words so that we could understand them and reflect them to others? In Jesus' name, amen.